There we go. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And this, this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube, because today we are talking about cholesterol. What is the best diet for someone who's trying to lower their cholesterol? Well, we got a question from a viewer who said, well, hey, my family is saying keto is the way to go, but I'm also hearing that a plant-based diet can really do big things to lower cholesterol. So which is it? Well, we are going to get the definitive answer when Dr. Neil Barnard joins us to open up the doctor's mailbag and answer more of your questions here on the program today, including if you're trying to lose weight. Should you cut seeds out of your diet? That's a that's an interesting question, right? Also have questions, uh, other questions about cholesterol and then B vitamins. Aside from vitamin B12, what role do they actually do? What is their purpose? We're going to find that out. And also somebody wrote in asking about a study, a new study that showed that children who eat a plant-based diet tend to have weaker bones, but they suspect that there's a big part of that nutrition puzzle that was missing with those researchers. So we're going to get into that with Dr. Barnard as well. And if there's something that you would like to ask the doctor, go ahead and post your question right now in the comments or in the chat box. We're going to get to as many as we possibly can here on the program today. You can also send that to me on Twitter and Instagram at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure that you use that hashtag exam room live. So let's go ahead and get everything rocking and rolling right now. And welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the show. Sir, how are you today? All right. I think you're doing good. I, I can't really hear you. Nope. Nope. Still muted. Still muted. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait. There. there. Hey, hey, welcome to the show. I would like to blame technology, but I think this might be user error. So anyway, no, no, how are you no. <laughs> I'm not doing really good. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah. Um, Here's uh, here's the question. This is the first one right out of the gate. It's a it's a really good one that we got from Stephanie, and she writes, "My cholesterol has gotten high enough that I have become concerned. I've seen on your show that a whole food plant based diet can help, but are there any foods that are more effective than others?" Um, well, great question, and thank you for asking it because you are not alone. Heart disease is extremely common, and high cholesterol is one of the big drivers of it. Um, let's take the first part of what you said, a whole food plant-based diet can help. Yes. Just getting the animal products off your plate is going to help a lot because that's the main source of saturated fat that causes your cholesterol to go up. And it also cholesterol is in animal products and really isn't in plant products to any significant degree. So just getting the animal products off your plate, that's job one. If you're not doing that, or if you're doing it sort of halfway, like here's a little cheese every now and then don't do that. Get rid of it all. No animal products. For, for most people, that really solves the problem. Um, but then your, the other part of your question is, are there some things that are really especially helpful? Um, yeah, there are a couple things that it's helpful to avoid. Um, tropical oils like coconut oil and palm oil. They're almost as bad as butter, so skip them. Things to add, soy products seem to have a little bit of extra cholesterol lowering power. Same with oats. You've heard the oatmeal commercials. Um, saying they'll lower your cholesterol. They do. Um, not a lot, but um, along with a healthy plant-based diet, you will see overall a huge effect on your cholesterol. Well, you're talking about animal products. Stephanie had the follow-up there. She says that my family says a keto diet can help to lower cholesterol because it's low in carbohydrates. Is there any truth to, to that, she's wondering? Um, not to the carbohydrate part. Carbohydrates don't tend to elevate cholesterol levels. Um, the, and frankly, a ketogenic diet is the last thing you want to do. When people go on a keto diet, many times their cholesterol levels do fall, not, not all the time, but in some cases it happens, but it has nothing to do with the good foods they're eating, supposedly eating. Um, they're eating a terrible diet in many cases of gravy and chicken and beef and that kind of stuff. The only reason their cholesterol levels fall is that on a ketogenic diet, you're leaving out so many foods that your body is effectively starving off the weight. And when your weight falls for any reason, cholesterol levels usually follow along with it. They usually fall too. But when you track a large group of people following ketogenic diets over a year or two years, on general, their cholesterol levels are higher, not lower, um, around 10% higher, especially in the bad cholesterol category, LDL cholesterol. So ketogenic diet, poor choice for every reason. It's big fad. I would, I would go nowhere near it. 
Question from Starlight. We talk a lot about vitamin B12 on this show, but Starlight is wondering, what about the other B vitamins? What role do they play? There's a lot of B vitamins, um, and they play important roles in many aspects of metabolism. Um, and some of them have important roles, anti-cancer effects like folate. You've heard of folate um, or in its supplement form, folic acid. They all play a myriad roles. Good news, you don't really need to go to the store to buy them because vegetables and the other aspects of a plant-based diet, the bean group, they've got the B vitamins covered. So that's why we talk about B12. That's the one that you're not gonna get in healthy plant foods. And that's the one that should send you off to the, to the grocery store or the health food store or the drug store to get a, a small B12 supplement and take it every day. You may have heard about this next study that uh, Scott is asking about in the news recently. He says, have you seen this new study that claims that vegan children have smaller and weaker bones? What are your thoughts on this? Um, when you look at diets, it's really clear that vegans do just as well as everybody else, provided they're getting an adequate calcium uh, content of their diet. If they don't, Anybody who's not getting calcium is going to have more trouble building bones. And so where are the healthy vegan calcium sources? Um, green leafy vegetables. That's what gives calcium to cows. Um, that's what gives calcium to us. Cows eat grass. We eat broccoli. Um, but the green leafy vegetables have plenty of calcium. Make sure you get it. All right. Question from Janice. Oh, she's in a good mood today. She says, your show is my classroom and all of your guests are my teachers. She says, I've been plant-based for two months. Could you please tell me if chia, flax, and hemp seeds in small amounts will impede weight loss? Small amounts, no. Um, huge amounts, yes, um, in theory, because they have some natural oils in them. Now, your body needs natural, uh, tiny, tiny traces of natural oils. You don't need to slather it on things, but within chia seeds or um, frankly, even within green leafy vegetables, you'll find tiny traces of natural alpha linolenic. This will not be on the test. Alpha linolenic acid and linoleic acid. Those are the natural oils. Your body needs just a tiny trace of that uh, for good, healthy metabolism. But if you went crazy with it and ate a lot of seeds, there is enough oil in there that you might see a little bit of effect on your weight. All right. Here's a question from Topher. It's a follow-up to a conversation we had actually months ago. So I guess Topher's just been wondering this for a while. Uh, they want to know, uh, Dr. Barnard, you said recently that cast iron pans and pots, not good. What should my pan be made of? Yeah. Cast iron. The, the reason that we're concerned about cast iron, everybody's got one, they, you know, their old pan that they love because they're indestructible. They last forever and they, they cook well. Um, but the smaller problem is that to cook with cast iron, you typically need oil um, and the oil gets into your food. But, but the bigger problem really is the iron itself. Back in the 1950s, we thought iron, you need it for red blood cells, the more the better. But then we learned something worrisome, that iron's got to be in a zone. And if it's too high, it increases the risk of heart disease. And perhaps more worrisome, it increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. At least that's the best conclusion we can draw from research. So um, what kind of pan do you get? Um, if you want to get a nonstick pan, I would go and get a nonstick pan like you'll see them from Made In, for example. It's a common brand where there's a healthy nonstick layer. And right the layer underneath it is steel. And there's aluminum in a layer below. But the reason why I'm suggesting that is that you want to avoid a cast iron. There's no cast iron in it. You also want to avoid aluminum. And so if the aluminum is in contact with the food, that's no good. So get a pan that's got a nonstick coating on top, assuming you're using a nonstick coating, but then the next layer down should be stainless steel. Let's take a question from a live viewer, 1209. Colleen sent this one in. She says, if I have type two diabetes, should my total carbs per meal be lower? She says, I've been increasing fiber and therefore my total carbs on a whole food plant-based diet. Um, let me make sure I understand. You're saying that I'm going to a plant-based diet. Should I be having uh, less carbs than I was eating before? Um, the answer is no. Um, carbohydrate doesn't drive diabetes. Um, this is something that is sort of a persistent idea that, that's understandable. Diabetes means there's too much sugar in your blood and that sugar comes from carbohydrate. So people think that's the problem, don't eat any carbohydrate. Mm -mm. Carbohydrate gives healthy glucose to your blood. 
your blood delivers it to your cells. And that's the way your body's designed because that glucose that comes from carbs that gets into your muscles gives you energy, goes to your brain, allows you to function. Um, without it, you can't live. Um, so the problem with diabetes is that for whatever reason, that glucose isn't getting into your cells. So you don't want to avoid carbohydrate. What you want to do is be able to get that carbohydrate into your cells where it can do some good. How do I do that? Get the fat out of your diet. When there's no animal products in your diet and oils are really low, then the fat that's been accumulating in your cells starts to dissipate. And then your insulin resistance starts to dissipate too. And your cells can take that sugar out of your blood. So the healthiest diet is actually higher in carbohydrate. Now, it should be healthy complex carbohydrates. This is not the Twizzler diet, um, but beans, grains, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, lots of them. Avoid the animal products, keep the oils really low. And what you'll discover uh, working with your doctor is that your glucose levels are gonna get better and better and better over time. So what do you think are some of the things that we can do to kind of educate others that not all carbs are created equally? Uh, the carbs from a sweet potato, not the same that you would get in that Twizzler you were just talking about. Yeah, but you know, let, let me say something a little controversial. A Twizzler is better than, than bacon any day. Um, <laughs> I got you know, there, there are so many people, they go vegan and they're, they're so worried that they got a little bit of sugar here or there. Who could care if it's, if it's a modest amount? Don't worry about that. The, the, the reason you have diabetes if you have type two diabetes is because fat from the foods that you've eaten has gotten into your muscle cells and into your liver cells. And that is what's stopping your normal insulin from being able to work normally. That's what's stopping insulin from being able to take sugar into your cell. We got to get the fat out of your diet. That means get rid of the chicken and the fish and, the, and all the other greasy stuff. Um, and when you do that, what will happen is that your body can start taking the sugar into the cells out of the blood. Cynthia now at 1214 is wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between refined sugar that you would find in candy and the natural sugar that you find in fruit. Yeah, um, they're all different and they're absorbed to a different uh, degree. And if you have fruit, this will surprise you. Um, let's say you have an apple, um, an orange, other fruits, and you have a certain amount of 50 grams uh, of the natural sugar there. And you have somebody next to you and they have 50 grams of table sugar. So one gets fruit sugar, the other gets table sugar. When you have it as fruit, what you discover is instead of spiking, your blood sugar just kind of gently rises as you take in the sugar and then it falls. Um, fruit is a surprisingly low glycemic index food. It doesn't really perturb your blood sugar that much. Whereas natural sugars include, or um, um, refined sugars, um, and the sugar in a soda, something like that, will typically cause a big spike. Here's a question from Tracy. Wants to know if eating beans causes bloating, should she stop eating them? I wouldn't stop eating them. Beans are, are good stuff. But if you're feeling, if you're getting a little GAS from eating <laughs> beans, um, two things. Number one, it's dose related. Have a smaller amount. As time goes on, your body will start to figure it out and you'll be able to digest them better. The other thing, is make sure they're really well cooked. Cook them until they're really soft. There are no al dente beans. And once in a while, you go to the store, you buy a can of black beans, and you open them up, and they are like little rocks. They just didn't cook them properly. You buy another brand, and they're nice and soft. Or if you cook them yourself, make sure you cook them until they're really soft. So smaller amounts, um, and make sure they're well cooked. Good advice there. Good advice. Oh, by the way, by the way, let's say you're having beans with rice. The rice won't cause the, the gassiness. So have, have more of that and less of the beans. And as time goes on, you'll find that you do okay with the beans. Uh, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about vitamin D. We've talked about how a lot of people are actually deficient in vitamin D. And Fernanda is one of them. She writes in to say that she does, in fact, have vitamin D deficiency. Her doctor recommended her taking a weekly pill with 50,000 international units for five months. But she's worried that that's just too much for one time. Should she be taking smaller doses throughout the week? Great question. Um, the short answer is stick with your doctor, get monitored and followed over time because your instincts are right. That, that's a very high dose. And that's a dose that you would never take um, normally just on your own without adequate testing. Um, in fact, a lot of doctors now are, I think, correctly suggesting doses around 2,000 international units a day. 
that's pretty good. That's pretty safe. Once in a while, it goes a little bit higher than that. But if you go much higher than that, um, you're getting into a toxic range. However, there are cases where people do need much higher doses to really restore where they ought to be. And doctors watch them like a hawk and they make sure that they're not getting into toxicity. So, so that, that recommendation is not outrageous um, in certain, uh, certain circumstances. And so um, talk to your doctor. You can get a second opinion and, and additional testing if you need to. But what your doctor will do is watch your vitamin D levels. We were just talking about sugar, and I think uh, Aura's ears perked up to that. At 1215, Aura writes, how long does it take to reverse type 2 diabetes when someone switches to a vegan diet? Everybody's different. Um, what will happen is, let's say, in fact, let's just kind of walk through how you would do this. Let's say you have diabetes now and you're thinking, I want to get rid of this. I don't know what to do. Take a week. Don't change your diet this week. But what your job is going to be is to identify foods that have no animal products in them that you would like. So you'll think about my breakfast. Okay, it could be oatmeal. My lunch could be um, bean chili. My dinner could be uh, spaghetti with tomato sauce instead of meat sauce. Take a week, figure it out. And now at the end of that week, now jump in. No animal products. Keep oils really low. As that happens, so how quick will you get better? What you'll discover is that day by day, you start losing weight and your blood sugars start to come down too. And the reason is that you, there's, almost, there's no animal fat in your diet. And if you're keeping oils really low too, there's not much of any kind of fat. So the accumulated fat in your muscles and liver is starting to leave and your blood sugar is now coming down. That's what should happen. So over time, uh, the blood sugar will descend. And in our NIH funded trial, we, start, we saw this as a, a really continual phenomenon. Um, in the first, say, um, 11 weeks of the study, we saw a lot of people's blood sugars dropping, but it, it kept going after that into 22 weeks, even into an additional year. So um, what, what you'll see is it's a gradual process. Um, one thing I would caution you, um, when you are starting, you're pretty insulin resistant if you're a typical person with type two diabetes. What that means is when you're eating a sweet potato or an apple, for the first couple of days, you might discover your, your blood sugar is spiking a little bit more than, than you would have expected. After about three, four days, that will settle out and then your blood sugar is typically gonna come down. Um, do all this in consultation with your doctor. Your doctor's gotta monitor you or your caregiver's gotta monitor you, but you'll see, that, that's about the time frame. Let's go ahead and try to get some practical advice here. This is a question from Joanne at 1212. She says that uh, her daughter is concerned that uh, she's eating a plant-based diet. She's also a cancer survivor, uh, but she's really thinking that that's not the healthiest route for uh, her. So when somebody in your family, somebody who you love is telling you that you, sh you shouldn't be doing this, they have concerns, how do you address that with them? Gee, I'll tell you. Um there are so many people in this in this situation where you're trying to take good care of yourself with a, a healthy plant-based diet and then family members who frankly don't know as much about nutrition as you do um, start to worry because what you're doing is a little different from them keep in mind a meaty diet is what often gets us into these problems and so we don't want to be continuing that for people um, with cancer um, the, I think we need more evidence, but the evidence is already quite substantial that a plant-based diet reduces the risk of many forms of cancer and also appears to improve the course of cancer once it's been diagnosed. Now, the, the, the best data, I'm going to say, are not so much in uterine cancer, but more for breast cancer, but it's, these are both hormonally related cancers. And what we saw from the WINS study, Women's Intervention Nutrition Study, is that when women previously diagnosed with breast cancer, would reduce the fat content, get away from more fatty foods. Um, what they found is that their likelihood of a recurrence was dramatically reduced. Um, the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study showed that when women greatly increased their vegetables and fruits and lace up their sneakers, their risk of recurrence is diminished also. Um, many studies have shown that soy products are helpful. Uh, they reduce the risk of recurrence by about 30% in women diagnosed with breast cancer. So with uterine cancer, very likely the same kinds of themes apply. 
Let's go back to cholesterol here momentarily. Take a question from 1221 at Irtis77. Uh, they write, when changing to a plant-based diet, how long will it take to see results in cholesterol levels? I would give it about eight weeks, something like that. Now, the truth is your cholesterol is going to fall sooner than that. But I wouldn't race down to the laboratory and get tested until it's been eight weeks, 12 weeks, something like that. So because you want to see what it'll do. Um, and what will happen in most people, the vast majority of people who go on a plant-based diet that's healthy, natural foods and avoids coconut and palm oil. Let me underscore that. Those are not health foods. Um, when you're avoiding all the animal products and, and following a really healthy diet, your, your LDL, bad cholesterol, will fall. Your total is likely to fall. Your triglycerides will fall. Those are blood fats. Um, unless you were indulging in a lot of uh, sugary stuff and refined, you know, the white bread kind of stuff, um, those will sometimes spike triglycerides. And if you avoid that, they'll come right down. All right, let's take a question from Jen. This is kind of a, a good news, bad news situation here. Jen writes that she's lost more than 100 pounds since adopting a whole food plant-based diet. But unfortunately, she's also been diagnosed with fibromyalgia and says that she is in pain. She's wondering what else should she be doing? Um, I'm sorry. Well, first of all, congratulations on your, on your weight loss. That's fantastic. I'm sorry to hear about the fibromyalgia. That can really drive you crazy for, for two reasons. One is because you, your, your body hurts. you got aches and pains. And the other reason is that your doctor doesn't understand you or in, in most cases, they, they don't know what to make of it. They don't have anything to offer. And so it's frustrating for both, re both reasons. Um, I wrote about this in a book called Foods That Fight Pain quite a number of years ago. And we need more research on fibromyalgia, but the pattern is very much like rheumatoid arthritis. Arthritis is pain in the joints. Fibromyalgia is pain between the joints in your soft tissues. And it's similar to rheumatoid arthritis in that for some people, certain specific foods can trigger their pain. And you never know which food it is and, and if this is you or not until you try. And so what I describe in that book and what I encourage people to do is an elimination diet. And what you do is you take, a, you take away all the animal products, which you've already done, and then you see how you do. But if you still have pain, which it sounds like you do, then an elimination diet takes uh, a number of other foods out. There are some foods that are really healthy overall, but they just might be a trigger for you. For example, um, citric acid. It's used in, in some things like sodas and, and quite a lot of other foods. Maybe that's trigger. Um, or it could be something totally innocuous like citrus fruits or apples or bananas. Could, could, could I be sensitive to, to a healthy food like that? Yeah. There are people who are allergic to strawberries. Nothing wrong with a strawberry, but if you're sensitive to it, you can't eat it. So we there are about a dozen common triggers. We avoid them all, see if the fibromyalgia settles out after a week or two or three, and then put those foods back in one at a time and see which one triggers pain. You'll see the details in Foods That Fight Pain. You'll also see it in The Cheese Trap, uh, which is a book that I wrote about cheese, which happens to be one of the most common triggers for health problems. Just got a nice note from Robert on Instagram says that uh, he was diagnosed with type two diabetes in March of last year, but he bought your book and got on the diet. And as of today, he says that he has lost 70 pounds and his A1C has dropped from 10.6 all the way down to five. So he just dropped a note. He wanted to say thank you so very much for everything that you put into the book. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Congratulations on, on what you've done. And thank you for that note. And I hope you've shared your experience with with your doctor and other people around you who are concerned about this because it's, I, um, we've been talking about the role of intramyocellular lipid and insulin resistance. And that's well known among diabetes researchers, but it's not so well known among a lot of doctors in day-to-day -day practice and, and not very well known among people who are struggling with diabetes. So anyway, thanks for the validation and congratulations on your experience. Let's take a question from Stephanie. This is an exciting day for her. This comes in at 1222. She says it's her first day on the 21 day kickstart. She's a little bit nervous, but super excited. She's wondering if you have any tips that could help her succeed. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, congratulations. You're doing a great thing. And my tip is think of this a little bit like jumping in the swimming pool. You know, everyone looks at the pool. They think, doesn't that look great? Um, but we're always a little nervous about jumping into it. Will the water be cold? 
and you jump in and it is kind of strange at first, but then pretty soon you discover the water's fine. And that's what you're going to discover with a vegan diet. So um, enjoy the 21 day kickstart. Look at all the resources that are there, the menus, the recipes, the cooking videos. Have at it. Got time here for a few more questions. So if you have one, go ahead, keep on posting it in the comments or the chat box, and we will do our best to get to it before the end of the show. Let's hop over to a question from Miranda here. She writes that her 49-year-old husband has unfortunately been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. She wants to know, could a plant-based diet reverse his symptoms or at least slow the disease's progression? Oh, well, I'm sorry that he's dealing with that challenge. Um, that can be so annoying and 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 frightening for many, many people. Um, the role of nutrition in Parkinson's disease has not been very well described by researchers, which means to say it hasn't been studied enough. The one thing that we really have seen is for people who are on treatment with L-DOPA for their Parkinson's disease, a diet change can make a big difference. And the diet change that, that is used is that that the diet is uh, to be very, very low in protein during the daytime hours because protein really from any source, if it's uh, overly abundant, makes the, the, the pharmaceutical treatment not work very much. So people really struggle. And then they have their higher protein foods, in this case, the soy or the, or the beans or whatever, at the evening meal. And that way, um, if your symptoms are a little bit worse, you're going to be asleep and you're not going to be aware of it. And then you wake up in the morning and have the lower protein foods all day. Here's a question from Mary wondering about lowering high blood pressure. She says she's been on a whole food plant-based diet for four months, lost 10 pounds, and she walks 10,000 steps every day. But her blood pressure is still 144 over 85. She's still taking medication. She's wondering, is there anything else that she might try to do to bring that down? Okay, great question and very, very common. So many people have it. Um, step one, look at sodium. I'm, you're probably doing this already, but just in case. Um, what are the high sodium foods? Well, if you're on a plant-based diet, you're not having cheese. That's good because cheese is astronomical in sodium. The amount, the amount, of, the amount of sodium in Velveeta is, is about three, two or three times higher than the amount in potato chips. Um, so look at other sodium, uh, high sodium foods, canned goods, snack foods. Those are the biggies, really. So lower your sodium. You want to be under about two grams a day, 2,000 milligrams. Number two, um, look at oils in your foods. Um, keep your foods not just vegan, but really low in oil. And the reason is that by avoiding the oils, your blood becomes more like water, less like grease. It flows more easily in your blood and your blood pressure comes down because you don't need a high blood pressure to, to push it. The exercise you're doing is fantastic. Your overall diet sounds great. Um, those would be things I would put to work. Uh, don't forget your fruits and vegetables. Um, I'm sure you're eating them a lot, but the, their potassium will bring blood sugar, uh, blood pressure down as well. And but the last thing is to say some people have what we call essential hypertension, which means essential is a word meaning I don't know why you have it. Um, and so for people who have that, then they see their doctor. And in that situation, you're quite correct to be following your doctor's advice about medication because high blood pressure is risky. All right. We talked a little bit about type 2 diabetes earlier in the show, but now we have a question from Sonnet at 1228 wondering, what do vegans with type 1 diabetes need to avoid? Um, they, well, first of all, if you have type 1 diabetes, a vegan diet is still the way to go. Um, in fact, you follow the same diet pretty much that's used for type two. Um, and that will make your doctor nervous because you're eating things like beans and sweet potatoes that have a lot of carbohydrate in them. But we published um, a case report uh, several months ago where we showed that when people go on a, people with type one, um, when they go on a plant-based diet, completely healthy plant-based diet, very often they need dramatically less insulin. And even better, their cholesterol levels are healthier and their weight is healthier, which means that they're at less risk for the cardiovascular complications. So it's a great way to go. The thing I would say is keep your diet as healthy as possible, meaning um, not so much uh, overly refined things, but your carbohydrate intake will come up because you're having whole grains and beans and root vegetables, and that's okay. 
You're going to continue to need insulin because you've got type 1 diabetes. Your body's not making insulin anymore. But hopefully the amount that you need will re be reduced because um, your own insulin resistance, which yes, you have it, even though you've got type 1, you also have some insulin resistance too. Everybody has a little bit that will be diminished. And so the insulin you're administering will go that much further and hopefully you'll need less of it. Uh, don't forget to see, to see your doctor. Um, I encourage everybody listening to this program that a diet change is important, lifestyle is important, but it doesn't substitute for making sure that you are talking with your caregivers and, and uh, following their advice. All right. Last question of the day comes from Reshang. This is at 1228. Let's see if we can get them some help here. Dr. Barner says, I have just started to eat a vegan diet. I'm 22 years old. What supplements should I be taking? Oh, great question. And thank you for asking, because I'm sure other people have that question too. Uh, number one is vitamin B12. You need it for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And go to any drugstore or any health food store and get the smallest one you can find. Um, the, the amount you actually need is 2.4 micrograms a day. And all the supplements are much higher. Um, you'll see 500 or 1,000 micrograms. Um, get the smallest one, 100, 200, maybe 500. If you're getting one that's much bigger than that, you might take it every other day. But B12, that's job one. Um, and frankly, that's the only one that you really do have to take. Um, but you might want to take vitamin D. Vitamin D normally comes from sunlight on your skin. If you use a sunscreen or you're indoors all the time and you're not getting sunlight on your skin, a vitamin D supplement will make up for it. Most doctors nowadays recommend about 2,000 international units a day. Um, that's about as far as I would go. Um, there are sometimes reasons for people to consider supplementing iodine or supplementing omega-3s, but generally I wouldn't go there without talking with your caregiver first. All right. Let's go ahead and close up the doctor's mailbag for today. If we didn't get to your question, fear not. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And also, Dr. Barnard, before we wrap things up for today, I want to take a moment to say thank you to Allison Mahoney and the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for their continued support of the Exam Room podcast and the Exam Room Live. We could not be doing the shows without their support. And the amazing thing about the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund is that it really it carries on Greg's legacy, you know, the love that he had for animals and the passion passion that he had for encouraging others to eat a plant-based diet. I mean, he really was just an extraordinary human being. And what Allison is doing with this fund now is just, it's exceptional the way that she's carrying on his legacy in that manner. And I know that you knew both of them quite well and, and just what great people they are. Absolutely. Thank you, Chuck, for mentioning that. Um, I couldn't agree more. And thank you, Allison. And also today, before we go, coming up next month, July 15th through the 17th, so basically one month from right now, uh, will be the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine. This is one of the biggest nutrition conferences of the entire year. And Dr. Barnard, I think that we have close to 30 speakers that will be presenting the latest science and research in nutrition and medicine and lifestyle. Again, entirely online this year, but I mean, you look at the lineup, you know, you're going to be there. Dr. Alan Desmond is going to be there. Our very own Dr. Hanna Kaliova, uh, Tim Key. So many great people are going to be there this year. You have to be just excited for what's what's on the horizon. Uh, it's going to be our biggest and best ever. Um, for, for health professionals, it's fantastic. For, for whether you're a doctor, a nurse, a uh, dietitian, physician's assistant, we've got the continuing education credits that everybody needs, and we've got lots and lots of them. Uh, but the courses vary from sort of some basic ones for people who are totally new to nutrition. Help me. Uh, you know, how do I uh, uh, treat a cholesterol level or how do I deal with heart disease or cancer? What are the dietary approaches that are really evidence based? But then we have lots more ad more advanced uh, information as well and four different culinary sessions. I think people are going to really love it. And we've got Dr. Columbus Batiste. He's going to be presenting there as well as will Dr. Robert Osfeld. Both of them and a lot of the other presenters will be guests here on the program in the coming uh, week. So stay tuned for that. But right now, if you would like to register and save your spot for ICNM this year, you can do that. And we've got a special offer just for exam roomies, you guys. If you go to pcrm.org slash ICNM right now to register and you use the promo code exam room, all one word, all lowercase, use 
use that promo code exam room, you can save $50 off the cost of registration and lock in your seat for the healthiest three days of the year. So pcrm.org slash ICNM, use that promo code exam room, save $50 and raise your health IQ in an extraordinary way. And for today, my friends, that is all the time that we have. Dr. Barnard, I want to say thank you one more time for spending some of your afternoon with us. Thank you, Chuck. And to the exam roomies and the crew behind the scenes, you guys both, you come together to help to make the magic happen, and I cannot thank you enough. And so for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon, but until then, keep it plant-based.